All right, so uh, presentation I put together today is talking about um, as code. Uh, so we're going to turn you all into elite ackers. No H, just ACers. Uh, lots of really good puns with this today, so I want to apologize in advance. Um, so this session, the slides, everything, I do store all my sessions in my GitHub repo, so the posh wolf slash, slash sessions. Um, however, I just got a reminder from James that everything will also be in the DevOps Collective. They have a repo for this. Um, so feel free to take pictures, but you can also grab the slides if you want, grab the code. Everything I'll be showing you today is in this repository. So, and Manoj, I'll wait for you to take that picture. There we go. Uh, so real quick, um, I am Anthony Howell. I go to school by the Posh Wolf Online, because it sounds cool. It's PowerShell related. My last name is Howell, so Posh Wolf. Uh, I'm from Eugene, uh, Oregon, so it's just a few hours south uh, on, on I-5, so that means that I like to uh, bike, eat granola, and grow out my beard. Uh, however, you notice that I do have a lack of a beard. Uh, that's because of uh, line two. I've got a wife at home. She likes it trimmed, so it's trimmed. Uh, got a couple of dogs, a few descendants. Uh, been in IT for, I think that's accurate, around 12 years. Um, I blog, I tweet sometimes, done a Pluralsight course. If you guys haven't heard of Tech Snips, it's a community we put together how-to videos, uh, consult on the side, but I'm also employed. It's the first year that I've ever been to the summit where I've had it paid for by my employer. So uh, if you've ever thought about whether or not it's worth it to pay for yourself, it totally is, I've done it twice. Um, and then if Eugene, Oregon sounds familiar, uh, this is the biggest cultural reference that I've seen for Eugene. Um, everyone, everyone knows Futurama, right? Really good TV show. Uh, Bender references it in the, um, uh, the Iron Chef episode. It's not, it's not a very um, uplifting reference to it, but it's uh, accurate. So, uh, yeah. But I'm here because I like PowerShell. So regardless of all the other stuff, that's why I'm here. That's why you guys are all here. Um, and I just put this slide in here to remind myself to actually say that, even though it should be obvious. Uh, so when we talk as code, you guys, sh I'm assuming most folks are familiar with um, some examples of what as code is. We have infrastructure as code as an example. Um, so in Azure, we have you know, ARM templates, Azure Bicep, uh, AWS, we got Ter or CloudFormation, and we got Terraform. And I'm sure you know, GCP, DigitalOcean, whatever else, they might have their own. I'm not familiar with it, so I'm, I didn't put it on this list. Um, but we also have you know, configuration as code. Uh, so PowerShell DSC is a really good example because we're all here. And then we have some configuration managers, you know, Ansible Chef, Puppet, SaltStack, uh, and there's probably others. And I just realized, so I work for a company that's sponsoring the Summit Runway, so we have some of the same features as some, as some of these guys. I probably should have put that in the list. I didn't. You want to hear about Mark Runway? Let me know after. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but what I really want to emphasize by first referencing existing tooling, uh, and then this slide to remind me to remind you that you always want to use existing tools. I am absolutely not suggesting that you should take and rewrite uh, Terraform in PowerShell, or that you should rewrite the um, DSC engine on your own. That is a bad idea. Okay. So I am absolutely not not uh, suggesting that, but instead I want to talk about some things that, that those may not be good solutions for. So not necessarily infrastructure, not necessarily like operating system configurations, and we'll get into that. Uh, so some of the foundational concepts that I want to talk about, um, and these are, these are pretty just as code uh, uh, topics here. So idempotency, um, idempotency, however you want to pronounce it, I always forget how to pronounce it. Um, Essentially, when you're running a script uh, and you want it to, the script to be Eden potent, you want to make sure that your you know, resource exists and it meets the required specifications. So you don't just say, all right, it exists, let's move on to the next one. Nope, it means it exists and meets the specifications. And in PowerShell specifically, the easiest way to do that uh, is that you build a splat, and then if it already exists, you just do a set resource with that splat. If it doesn't, it doesn't exist, you do a new resource with that splat. That's the easiest way to do it. Um, if you really, if you need to do some more auditing, you want to go through and check each property because anyone that's run like a Terraform like plan, you get to see exactly all the properties that's going to change or add and all that kind of good stuff. You could do something like that in PowerShell, but at that point, you might want to consider using one an existing tool. Uh, and then, anytime that I'm doing a, an an ACK project, um, I'm typically or well, you, I'm going to be doing it inside of some kind of pipeline. Uh, so when you're doing a PR to your um, config, uh, you want to be able to test and output what's going to change so that before it gets merged, 
you can see what's going to change, and then assuming it's good, you're going to merge it. So we'll look at some of the examples I've got. Actually, all the examples I've got, I include a pipeline that we will we'll cover as well. Uh, so what we're going to go through today is we're going to uh, finish talking about the approach here. So I've got some, just a few more slides, and then we'll get into some code. Uh, we're also going to, I'm just going to, instead of walking back and forth here, uh, I've got one example. So these first two, or actually these are all real world examples that I've used. Uh, this last one I still use today. Um, just a really basic example that literally is just, the config is literally an array of strings in a text file. It sounds crazy, but it's, it's actually not. Um, and we'll explain why. And, and secondly, we've got, I've got another example we'll go through. And I, I call this a simple example. Um, and I'm going to try to keep it as a simple example because it might be kind of complicated to explain. But we've got, I've got a lot of examples, a lot of code. Um, and then if we still have time, uh, I've got a YAML example. I don't know if you guys have read the, um, I don't know what they call it, the little summary. I referenced JSON. So in the last you know, two months, I found out that there's a YAML, uh, convert to, convert from YAML in PowerShell. It's a separate module. So I did a YAML demo as well. We can look at that. Uh, but the big reason, uh, the big question, I should say, is why do you want to do things as code? And this is, the answer to this, uh, it can really be applied to, you know, you know why, why do you want to use Terraform? Why do you want to use um, the DSC or some kind of configuration manager? Um, but why would you want to do it yourself? Why can't you just write a script, you know, have some variables at the top maybe, or maybe it's just a function and you accept parameters? Well, the big reason, and this comes from my background of working with a lot of different teams and none of them have a do PowerShell, but they like the automation aspect. The big reason, and this, blow, this is going to blow your mind because it blew my mind. Nobody cares about the code, okay? I know a present company excluded, right? We all do. Well, we're all here because we like PowerShell. But no one else cares about it. You can do the coolest thing in PowerShell and tell your boss, like, dude, I figured out how to, do, how to use hash tables, and they are so much faster than PowerShell objects. And he's going to say, well, does it produce results? And you're going to say, well, it's the same as before, and so I'm not going to care. <laughs> but we care, I care, you care, so we're going to be looking at some of the code today. Um, and, and the reason we, we do as code stuff is because we focus on the results. So the results are the config, right? So when you build the config, you expect that config to actually be what ends up being produced. So if you have a Terraform config, you expect all the things that you express in your Terraform to actually end up in Azure, AWS, etc. And so that's one of the really important things to focus on when you get into um, acting. Uh, and separately, you know, we can talk about you know, um, version control. You're separating the config from the code, so then you can actually go through and audit the changes. Uh, and assuming you're only using um, your ACK pipeline to make these changes, you will always have any change that happens in, in, in the environment will be reflected in the configuration change. Um, and then secondly, you can allow non-PowerShell users to use your system, you teach them how to update the config, which if we design it right, it should be readable and understandable. Um, and I have this line, your security team will thank you. So most of the work that I've done, acting related, uh, is all been for our, uh, when I say our previous company, uh, we, uh, the security team was my primary consumer of these, because they are all about auditing and tracking and configuration management and all that good stuff. Uh, but lastly, uh, and I want to thank Manoush here for this one, this allows you to get into being able to do DevOps without being in DevOps. Uh, and I thought this was really, really cool because uh, you, can get in, you can use pipelines to manage your you know, O365 environment. You can use it to manage Exchange. Um, and I'm using those examples because I'm hoping that they're fairly universal here. Uh, so last thing, uh, prerequisites, PowerShell check, right, everybody? Uh, JSON, YAML, we got convert to, convert from for both of those in PowerShell. Um, and then if you're using VS Code, you get all that nice syntax highlighting and the red squiggles when it's not right, so that kind of thing. And then uh, modules, you know, I was really stretching for prerequisites for this presentation. If you guys have used a command that you've used the module, and that's, that's really all I'm getting at here. Um, and then I'm on Windows 10, latest VS Code, PowerShell 7.2.2. Um, however, this would all work in PowerShell 5 if you wrote it for PowerShell 5. Uh, so let's jump into it. Any questions before I jump into it? Okay, cool. If I forget to pause for questions, feel free to shout them out. I don't do this very often, so if I forget to ask for questions, it, it won't surprise me. Uh, okay, so 
the first thing I want to look at is just kind of understand uh, when I'm saying making a config, what I'm talking about. So in this hypothetical situation, we're not going to write any code. Um, but we want to manage uh, Active Directory groups uh, using an ACK approach. However, this is a really terrible example because there is a DSC module or DSC resource for doing Active Directory. I chose this as an example because it's something that's easy to understand. And I feel like everyone here, know, everyone knows what Active Directory is? Anybody not know what Active Directory is? Okay, so that's my point. Um, so if you were to look at this config, can, it, can you guys guess what this config uh, is supposed to do? It's going to make sure these folks are members of these groups, right? It's pretty easy to understand. And the script to do this, um, I don't know what, 10, 15 lines maybe? It's not, not really all that complicated. And so with this simple example, you could, you could tell your security team, like, you don't need to, we don't need to set you up with um, domain admin access to um, Active Directory. We just need you to mo modify this config. The script will then sync those changes in an Active Directory. We're all good. Um, but the problem with this is what if you also want to manage some additional properties about uh, these groups in Active Directory? So you notice that, the, that each group is a key, so it would be a hash table in PowerShell, and it has an array. So they're written in just an array of strings. There's nothing we can do to this, uh, this config to actually make it more complicated. So we could, we could switch this around and do something like making that, that group now is an, is an object, and we can know that uh, because of the squiggly brace here. So in JSON, that is an object, uh, and in PowerShell, that would be a hash table. Um, and so now we have members, we have the location, and can you all guess what the location means? It means the group's gonna be in that location. Um, restrict membership, so I was getting a little fancy with these last two just to create some examples. So, I'm envisioning that if restrict membership is true, that this script is going to go through and make sure that only these users are members in that group. So it's going to do, you know, get existing group membership, or sorry, get 80 group members for that group, uh, and then for each of those users, if they're not already in this list, remove them, and then for each of these users, if they're not already members, add them. So it adds a little complexity, but the script still isn't going to be all that complicated. Uh, and this last one, Let's say you have, you have some sort of monitoring set up either through a script or another tool. Monitor, monitor equals true. That means the script in the background is going to make sure that uh, however it's monitoring it's set up for this group. And that could be, I'm being really high level with that because, you know, it's going to be different in every environment. And another way to do this, uh, and I'm getting into the weeds of JSON, uh, is we could uh, create, an, so this is an array, so this square bracket represents an array, and so now we have an actual um, so imagine this as a PowerShell custom object, right? It's got all these properties, uh, and now instead of the name being the key, the name is now just a property of the object. And the choice between the two is going to be completely up to you. They both, they're both good. And then if we wanted to represent that in PowerShell uh, notation, and you could, there's no reason you couldn't build just a variable, uh, sorry, a .ps1 file as your config. And so this is, in, in this case, it's a hash table the groups, and I built this one as a hash table. You could switch around to an array if you wanted, um, but just to give you an idea of what that would look like in PowerShell, yes? Uh, that is going to depend. So the advantage, and I'll talk, actually, I do a lot of uh, hash table examples. Um, so the big advantage of hash tables is you can look up by key extremely fast, whereas if you have a huge array of objects and you're doing piping it to where object, that's slow. So it's going to depend on how you use it. Good question, though. Uh, and then I have just another quick example, uh, just because I wanted, didn't, didn't want to just stick to Active Directory. But if you guys look at this config, can you, let me get the mouse out of the way. Can you guess what that's pr probably going to do? If you haven't figured it out already, it's going to create a re resource room called conference room run with some of these um, parameters. Oh, and that's not even going to parse, because it's got an extra comma in there. Oh, sorry. Yeah, extra comma. You, I, so there's no code behind these ones. I just wanted to give you an example of what I'm saying acking is that you can, you can make these configs to anything, and it's just a matter of writing the code. And what are we all here because we're good at? It's writing PowerShell, right? So, yeah. So that's, that's why we wanted to cover the configs first. So, so what, what, what I'm going to walk you guys through is a couple of um, real-world problems that I solved using this approach. So 
I worked for a company where we had about, I think it was like 100 plus uh, clinics, and we were growing, we got a lot of funding, so it was going up by hundreds a year. Uh, it sounds like a huge number, it was a huge amount of money. Um, and so our security team wanted one F MFP service account per site, uh, which means we had hundreds, uh, and it's really unwieldy. And so before, we, uh, before this was act, someone wrote a really nice detailed SOP. It wasn't me, someone else wrote this really nice detailed SOP, but the problem was the folks that were setting up the MFPs generally didn't have permissions to create the accounts for it. And so uh, we, I act this, and so the, now the SOP is um, they have to branch the repo, update the config, submit a PR. Pretty simple, and we could give them access in GitHub to do that. So this is the example where the config is literally an array of strings in a text file. And let me explain why. So all of our sites, we had, um, they were given a site ID, which was a terrible naming convention because apparently no one's good at naming conventions, myself included. Um, and each site needed a service account, and they all had the same requirements. So the script itself is going to be fairly, uh, fairly straightforward. Um, so these are all running in, uh, I, write, I write these scripts that all run inside of a GitHub action workflow. Uh, so th these are parameters at the top. These are just um, uh, the certificate. You create the, um, the Azure AD registration, and you can authenticate that way. I've got a separate blog post if you guys are interested in seeing on how to set that up, but that's what these parameters are for. And we're authenticating to graph. Uh, and again, this is part of that same blog post. If you've got questions about it, let me know, and I can send you that, that link. Uh, but pretty straightforward here. Uh, we're loading that site. Is, it, is this text big enough for you guys in the back? Okay, I'm seeing the head nodding. Okay, okay. Uh, so we're loading, we're just literally loading that from the, that text file. Um, we had requirements to make sure they were members of these groups. Um, we managed multiple domains, so we had to specify the domain for the for the uh, the service accounts, uh, and they all received the Exchange standard license, which would allow them to send emails. Uh, and so the script, fairly straightforward. Um, we're loading up. Loading up the license, we're grabbing the existing group members in these groups uh, so that we can, of course, see if they're already a member and then add them if they're not. Uh, and the same, this is the same thing for the second group. Uh, and down here, so all of our service accounts uh, started, had a prefix, so I'm getting all the existing ones so that I can see if it already exists or not. And then, because I like hash tables and we're gonna be checking this array to see if it has a, uh, a service account with a specific email address. This is where I'm doing that, uh, setting up the array so I can do a lookup by email address instead of piping an array to where object. I like hash tables, um, and in this case, it's a lot faster. And then for each site, um, I'm building up uh, just the, the UPN, and then I, I mentioned earlier the easy way to do it is <laughs> with the splat, uh, and so with the graph module, uh, new MG user and set MG user takes the same, uh, the same parameters. So literally just building a splat for that. Anyone here not familiar with splatting? Okay, cool. So it's just, you know, hash table of the parameters. And so down below, I'm saying if, if the, uh, if that user already exists, then I would update it. And you notice, I forgot to mention this, uh, just like when I practiced this morning, <laughs> uh, the test parameter. So in a pipeline, you want to be able to support a PR being submitted. And so this is where, and I'll, I'll show the, the actual workflow. If this is a PR, the workflow is calling the script with the test parameter. And the test parameter is just up at the top under params, we got test. And so this, so, when we're looking at this code, so if test is present, so if this isn't a PR, or sorry, it's not present, so if this is a, uh, a merge, so this is after the PR is accepted, uh, we're gonna run a, a set. And so this output is just gonna, t this output right here is gonna output to the GitHub action log, and so we'll know if we're reading that, that this account already exists and it would be updated. So a better iteration of this script would be to go through and check every single property and compare the differences. And then it's gonna be, if, if you were gonna do something like that, it would be up to you whether or not you wanted to make that effort. 
I was under time constraints for this, so I had to make some, uh, uh, some sacrifices there. And if the account doesn't exist, then of course we're gonna, we're gonna create it. And then lastly, we got the two group members, or sorry, the two groups as well. So early in the script, we got the existing members, so we're just saying if that, uh, that array contains that, uh, the user's ID. So uh, get mg group member returns um, the actual like, GUID of the user, and so we have to grab the, sorry, have to grab the user itself when we get the GUID. We can't just use the, the UPN for it, but that's all it's doing. So if you're looking at this script and wondering, well, uh, if you guys were paying attention, I said, like, acting, the point of acting is that you don't have a group of variables at the top. Did anyone notice the um, hypocrisy here? <laughs> uh, so, this is the V1 of the script that I wrote. And then while I was preparing for the presentation, I was like, wow, I'm a huge hypocrite. So, uh, I, I, I rewrote this in a way that I would expect to after having sit and listened to my opinions here. Uh, so, <laughs> we have the same text file, but now, we have a, a JSON config. And if you look at this, uh, we can see we got prefix. So I mentioned the prefix before. All of our service accounts had this prefix so we could easily find them. And then our, our license as well as the groups that this wants to be, or that the service account needs to be a member of, as well as the domain. So now, and I will just run through the top of this script. Now we are authenticating again. Uh, we're, loading, we're loading the sites from the text file. But now we're also loading that, um, that JSON config. And you notice um, I have this as hash table. This is PowerShell, I think, I can't remember if that was six or seven, but these all run, or all were written to run in PowerShell seven, and I prefer hash tables. So I've got the as hash table there. And when we look up that license, we're just referencing that, um, uh, that uh, key in the hash table to get the correct license. And the groups, we now don't have hard-coded groups, so it's a for each group. Uh, checking the memberships, and then it's gonna be the same thing down below when we're actually down at the bottom, um, when we're actually checking to see if uh, that, user member, mem that user is a member of the group, we're just gonna do for each group and groups. Uh, and you notice I'm, I created a hash table to, tra to track all the group memberships, so that's where that's, where that's for. Yes? I did not. That is a, uh, so that is a, that's a really good point. Um, and in this case, um, uh, so that's something I didn't even think to touch on for this, this talk. Um, so in this case, imagine that, um, that this, uh, so this uh, O2 folder, um, this is the, you know, the second iteration of that, that this is a GitHub repository in and of itself. Um, however, the CI/CD is going to be in a very specific location, and then you could hard code them. But if you were working in a situation where you wanted people to be able to add multiple configs potentially or what have you, then yeah, you would want to parameterize it. That does make a lot of sense. Uh, and so the CI/CD itself, uh, we'll take a look at here. So this is this is GitHub specific. I don't know what this will look like in other CI/CDs, but there's no reason you couldn't accomplish something similar. Uh, so uh, on pushes and pull requests, so this, this, is, this tells, it, tells GitHub when to run this workflow. And then workflow dispatch, uh, this allows you to run the workflow on demand. Uh, and I actually added this in here after somebody screwed up a lot of the service accounts. So I could just click, rerun with an existing config, uh, and don't have to worry about figuring everything out myself. Uh, and since we're PowerShell 7 and the Microsoft Graph module is cross-platform, running on Ubuntu, it's a lot cheaper than running on Windows. Uh, and these first, these first three actions, um, if you guys ever worked in, in GitHub Actions, these have saved me so much time. This is the um, Christy Lemaire's uh, module cacher. So if you're working with big modules like Graph or Exchange, this will save you minutes every time it runs. And if you're running this a lot, those minutes are gonna add up. So I highly recommend, I, I couldn't explain what each of these actions does, but when you have all three of them together, it works. So uh, this is a copy paste for me. You could probably templatize it, but. Uh, and then down at the bottom, this is, this is where the magic is. Uh, so I have this one called run script on PR. 
So this if statement is just saying that if it's a PR, run this. Uh, and so the run uh, is going to look the same for both of them until we get to the end. So you notice I have the test parameter. So when this is a PR, it's going to run the whole script but with the test parameter. And then we get our output to see what would change uh, and when we actually do a merge, which is down below, and you notice that we're not calling it with the test parameter. Does that make sense? Okay. And then here we've got the if, you know, the GitHub event name equals push. So that, that's the, um, the conditional statement there. So that was a pretty simple example. I've got a more complicated one to kind of demonstrate um, some, of the, some of the really cool things that you could do uh, with an acting approach. So same place I was at, we had uh, 20, I think it was 20-ish regions, maybe a little more, and everybody, all the regions wanted a distribution group that was specific to that region. Uh, and if you guys ever tried to manage a large number of distribution groups, that's, yeah, that's headache inducing. And so we're like, well, let's do dynamic groups. But the, but the problem is now we still have to manage um, all these different regions and the company was growing and I didn't want to have to create a new dynamic or new set of dynamic groups every time we had a new region. So my response was that that was not reasonably possible. And I, I love that reasonably possible phrase. Anytime anyone asks me to do something that uh, would require a lot of uh, clicky clicky, that's not reasonably possible. That's just my default response, okay? <laughs> uh, and so uh, I suggested, you know, setting this up and so with an acting approach, we now have a config where we can, we can templatize all of the, um, the queries to build the dynamic groups. So let's take a look at that. And we're gonna, a lot of the stuff is gonna be similar, so we'll skip over some of it, but if you don't want me to stop, let me know. So, in this case, I have um, two configs. And I do wanna emphasize that when I say I have two configs, I'm not saying like this is the best way to do it, right? This is just how I decided to do it. Uh, and so, in this config, we have uh, just a couple of the regions. I'm just using Seattle and Portland as examples since they're close by. Uh, and then, in, in the gal, dynamic distribution grid lists don't show up differently from other distribution lists to the normal user. So we added a prefix to all of them, so they would. And then the actual config itself to build the lists, and I'm gonna uh, minimize some of these just to uh, focus here. So. The first request was to be able to email everybody in a single region. And so if you look at this config, does that make sense? So let me explain this filter for anyone that's not familiar with a dynamic distribution list, lists. So a dynamic distribution list, you give it a query and it adds all the people that meet that query into the list. Does it automatically, updates automatically, don't ever have to worry about it. And so we had an attribute that we got HR to manage, thank God, instead of us. Um, and it was our custom attribute one in exchange, and it, was, it would be equal to whatever region a user was in. And so with this config, the script behind it is gonna say, all right, for each region in the config.json, I'm gonna create a distribution group, or sorry, dynamic distribution group that, that is, we're gonna call region-all, so Seattle-all, with that filter. And I chose to use uh, dollar sign region here, this is gonna be replaced. So you could really do, you can do the curly braces, whatever you want to actually replace that. That's just how I chose to do it, because I'm like PowerShell, so variables to me always start with a dollar sign. Um, and, and after we got that working, they were like, oh, I wanna email all the providers. So let me, let me make this a little bigger. So this is a uh, primary care provider, so we, uh, we worked with a lot of doctors, and we were, uh, um, insurance requires us to actually track who is, is and who isn't a provider. And so our HR team, thankfully, already tracked this. And so they gave us these attributes so we didn't have to worry about managing them. Uh, but now we have a region-provider uh, which is gonna be, have this filter. So everyone that's in that region and is a provider. That make sense? And this next one should be, should be really easy to understand. Everyone that's in this region and is uh, has the staff attribute. So we called everyone that wasn't a provider, we called them staff. And then this last one is gonna be similar, however, uh, it's just a little slightly more complicated filter. And this, I had a one region say, well, we need this group to just to talk to all of our MAs. I said, okay. 
uh, asked around. No one else seemed to think that that was really important. So I added this feature uh, to the script, and I'll show the final product instead of the, the, um, the evolutions of it, to where we could specify which group was going to be in which region. So in this case, this region is it's just going to apply to Seattle. I'm just going to get a Seattle-MA. And this one, um, thankfully, we stand, finally standardized titles. So you can see at the end, it's just a bunch of titles. If your title matches this and you're in a region, you're an MA. These are all MA-related titles. So the script itself is actually not all that complicated, which is, which is something that really surprises me, writing these things. So the top, uh, this is going to be very similar to authenticating to graph. However, we're going to be authenticating, oh, authenticating to exchange. So that's what this, this portion is here. Uh, and again, I've got a blog post on this if you want to you try to replicate this in GitHub Actions. It explains everything, how to prepare and then how to use this. Uh, but we're loading the, the configs themselves. So we've got the, the config.json. We have the region-based.json. Uh, the region base is where we have the dynamic distribution list, and the config is where we have uh, the prefix um, and the regions. And these could be, you know, I was looking at this this morning when I was doing a practice run. They could just be in the same config. There's no reason they, they're two files except that I put them in two files. <laughs> uh, so the first thing we do is load all the existing dynamic distribution groups, uh, and I'm putting them in a hash table. And this hash table is going to be, the key is going to be the name. This allows me to look them up very quickly by name, since we're um, identifying in the config by name, so we don't have to pipe it to where objects. So this is where hash tables can uh, save you a lot of time. And then for each region, uh, I've got some output here. This will show up in the GitHub Action Pipeline to tell me, you know, as it works through the regions, like which region it's working on. And then for each uh, dynamic distribution list in the region base, so, uh, so the first time through, this is going to be looking at Seattle, for example. And this first line, line 35, so this is where I added the capability to be able to selectively choose which regions. Uh, and so if the current region that we're working on, which we're looking at here, or sorry, I'm confusing myself. In, if the current dynamic distribution list, like it says there on the screen, um, contains the current region that we're working on, or that is equal to all, so let's look at that config again. Uh, for my own sake. So if this region example equals Seattle or equals all, then we're gonna do we're gonna go ahead and create those. And so then in the script again, uh, we're gonna build the name. And so the name uh, just built with the let me clear that out here, uh, with the prefix followed by the name that we specify in the config, but we're replacing uh, that region with uh, with the current region that we're working on. So in this case, you know, I'm doing a regex replace with the uh, dollar sign region. And then for some reason, I couldn't, I couldn't figure out why, I'm also removing spaces. I guess I probably just could have deleted that before this, but there it is. And then for the sake of the log, we're also outputting the generated name. So in case something goes wrong, we'll see that. And then the filter itself, we're just grabbing the filter from the config, replacing region with region again. Uh, and then if the existing dynamic distribution, if the existing dynamic distribution groups contains uh, the, a dynamic distribution group with that name, uh, then we're gonna output that we're going to be updating it. And so now if we scroll over uh, down below, if it doesn't already exist, we're gonna create it. And so this is where the, you know, the, the set and new splats that I was talking about, same, same concept. I mean, these aren't splats, they probably should be. Uh, but if we scroll over, these are exactly the same. And this is where, this is one of the things I really like about a, a, a well-designed module that has new and set that have the same parameters because you can do things like this to where they're exactly the same. So, does that make sense? It's, I know this is kind of a niche use case for, for acting, but it's one that, that I enjoyed putting together. Uh, and then so the CICD, this is going to be exactly the same uh, except for... Well, actually, no, this is exactly the same. <laughs> so, I mean, we can, we can see here down that if we, down here that if the event is a pull request, we are going to use the dash test uh, parameter so that we can actually uh, just, just see what's gonna change versus what is gonna change. Or, 
That doesn't make any sense. See what's going to change versus actually changing it. And then uh, this, this last one, of course, is actually going to make that change. So uh, any questions on that? Cool. So uh, since I talk a lot faster live than I do when I practice, we are going to take a look at the, my extra content that I had just in case this happened. So <laughs> yeah, it's, it's uh, yeah. Right. So, um, so has anyone here seen, I'm trying to think, uh, well, actually, so GitHub Action Pipelines or even um, Azure DevOps Pipelines or Ansible Runbooks, they all use YAML. So does this look like the format, you guys are all familiar with YAML formatting? So in Runway, so Runway is the company that I work for, we're sponsoring the summit, so I don't feel bad about talking about them. Um, we, we, ha we have the ability to run jobs, and a job is consisting of actions, so it's kind of like the Ansible run books versus, um, I'm sorry, I don't know all the Ansible terminology. Um, uh, but we had a customer come to us and say, hey, our, our new DevOps guy, who we would like a lot, he says we should use YAML because it, or use YAML. He says we should use Ansible because we can write our, all of our, our playbooks in YAML and then source control them. I was like, well. We have this really cool PowerShell SDK, and I know that because I wrote it. And if you want to see, if you guys want to get into auto rest and building PowerShell SDKs, I got a session on Thursday. And so what I did is I threw together what I thought a decent YAML config would be. So in this case, the job, we have the name of the job. Uh, in Runway, runner is just an endpoint that has our agent on it. So that's all the runner is. And this tags, this is, this is telling the script to assign this job to all runners that have these two tags. So they're Windows and Site 1. And then this builds the schedule, and we have a really funky scheduling system. You can pretend like that doesn't exist, because it's going to be a cron notation at some point. Um, we're a startup, so things are changing all the time. Um, and then all the actions that are going to run. And the cool part is um, this happened like less than a month ago. And I was like, man, this would be really cool if I could do something like this for the summit. Uh, and then that's when I found that there's the PowerShell YAML uh, module, so I didn't have to worry about trying to parse YAML. Has anyone here ever written a parser? Yeah, me, me either. <laughs> so, uh, so the code itself, uh, if, and if you're looking at this, you might, you know, might be thinking that it's going to be kind of complex. It's actually not, which has surprised me. Uh, so I have it separate it out into, uh, let's see, we ha have some like helper functions that if we have time we can get into. Um, but the parameters, we're just looking for either the raw YAML or the path to the YAML file. And we even have the test parameters that look familiar. Uh, so we're going to load the YAML. And I love this module. Um, I can't even reference who, who wrote it because I don't remember. Um, PowerShell-YAML in the, in the gallery. Convert from YAML, it's so easy to use. And now what that does is it gives us a hash table. Uh, and for some reason, it just does hash tables by default. Um, and, that, and that can be confusing if you're not used to hash tables. So just, just be aware of that. And so with that object, and let's, let's see. Does anyone remember what the, what the shortcut is to get a document to stay open in? Oh, just, it just edit it. See, you guys are smart. That's why I love coming to the summit. Oh, oh, I didn't know that. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, there we go. Now it's yeah, even the the format of the the title is different. Okay, cool. Thank you. I knew there's a way to do it. I just couldn't remember. I always forget things when I'm on the spot. Uh, okay. What's that? Oh, just people whispering. Okay. So, so what we're, what we're going to have here is we're going to get a hash table that's going to have a jobs key, a local users report key, a runner's key. Well, these are, you know, these are all going to be, you know, you can see the, sorry, I'm not supposed to be in front of the screen. You can see, you know, the, the indention is going to, you know, uh, notate um, being sub-properties. And this action, so that dash uh, in YAML means that the actions is actually going to be an array. This is something that I learned. Um, and looking at this. Uh, so the array is going to have in this first line, let me use my mouse so I can actually uh, do some highlighting here. 
So this, this is actually going to be an object that has a single property called name. So name, and it's going to be equal to endpoint colon get local user. And the second one is going to be an object that has a name equals download file, and that's going to have another property that is a connector, and then the, uh, this property is going to be a hash table that is, thanks Mike, uh, that is going to be uh, name equals uh, file server local users. So if we look at the code itself, so I'm saying, I'm, I'm skipping over the connectors part because that's going to be explaining a part of runway that we just don't have time to. It's really cool that it allows you to move data between runners with no VPN. So if you want to talk about it, let me know. Uh, Jobs. So we do a lot of write information here. So since, it, since this was a module that I've written that we have customers using, I'm trying to be a best practice, uh, use best practices here so I have write information. So that's why you see that here. And so for each job, so first, first of all, we're saying, you know, if the jobs key exists, and then for each of those jobs, we're going to write information. Uh, and this, and in this case, I got really fancy with the output because it's a lot easier to read. So you write the YAML, right, and it's all indented, and that indentation makes sense because you can understand what's a child of what. And so I did something similar with this output to make it really easy to read. So, so we have write information with just dash job, and then when we're updating that existing job, I added a couple of spaces here. And I've seen people do this better where they actually have, they, they identify the indention character, they have their own uh, function, and they say, well, this should be too deep, and so the function then builds the spaces. I manually put it in here. That's in the, you know, the backlog for maybe improving this at some point. Uh, and so if the job doesn't exist currently, or sorry, if it does exist, we're just going to get the existing. Uh, and if it doesn't exist, we've got the else, uh, we're going to create it. But we're only going to create it if test is not present. So we have the if test is present, uh, then we're just going to write some extra output here to say that we would create this job. Uh, and if it's else, we're going to actually say the new job equals, and we're going to create the job. So in this new RW job, this comes from the, our PowerShell SDK. And so if it contains a schedule, so we have, we're doing a lot of ifs here. Uh, then we're going to actually create the schedule. So you can see we're going to add the schedule. So we, we build the schedule, and then if test is present, then we're just going to say, well, we would set the schedule too. And in this case, I was having some issues with it, so I actually built some useful output here to actually tell me what the schedule would look like. Uh, and then, of course, if we're test is not present, we're actually going to set the schedule. And the same thing for actions. Uh, this gets, I mean, I, this gets more into the weeds of you know how you build the actions. But the cool part with this is since a job and runway can take multiple actions and they're ordered, um, I'm actually, I actually took the, took the time to, to, to build out an index here. And so we're going to say when we create the job, or sorry, when we create each action, we're going to say, well, this is action one, here's the name. Action two, here's the name, and on down. Uh, and then assigning the runners is the same kind of, kind of deal. So if it contains runners, we're going to add the runners to it. And we get some fancy stuff in the API to actually assign runners. So you can, you know, you can use, uh, just use the tags here as, as groupings, essentially, to assign a bunch of them. Uh, and then, down at the end, of course, there's a, as ex explaining the runway API probably way too much, but just the groups that's assigned to a job is called a set in the API, so we have to do some syncing, and that's where that has the helper function. But in two minutes, we have the actual, oh, it's in a separate repository. Give me a second, if you guys want to see it. YAML demo, there it is. So this is where we actually have the CICD. Um, and I, I did run into one interesting thing that I want to mention just really quick. So by default, if you use write information, your information preference is, thank you, yes. And so the first time I did this, I was like, why doesn't write information work? So you always have to remember to do the information Preference equals continue. Uh, and then in this case, we're authenticating to the API, and then for each YAML, we're actually calling that. And then if this is, is this the pull request? Oh, you see, I even forgot. So this should say also, dang, that's bad. That should say test. And this is the, the demo that I gave to our customers, so I will be emailing them after this. <laughs> so, yeah, I, don't, I hope not. <laughs> So any, any questions? You guys are all ready to be actors now. I really do want to emphasize, like, don't replace existing tools. Like, this is not, this is not designed, 
flight, and it's not, like it's not a thing, but this you know, approach, you, know, you shouldn't be replacing DSC, you shouldn't be replacing Terraform, all that good stuff. It's just when those tools don't, don't fit. And I, I got a lot of mileage out of this kind of approach, so I hope you guys can too. Cool. That's all I got.